in the College of Communication, Arts, and Sciences, mm -hmm. and he's going to talk about uh, communication theory, how that sort of connects to radicalization and de-radicalization. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to be enthusiastic. It's okay. Like I said, you're getting an hour off of work, if nothing else. Be enthusiastic about that. Before I start, let me tell you what I hope this was going to be and what it's going to be in reality. What I hoped it was going to be it was going to be me showing you some really cool results from two studies that I put together and everything. Um, when I was asked to do this, I think you guys asked me about two months ago or so? Yeah, about two months ago. So at that time, I was going back and forth with my department as to how many research participants I was going to get. And I was told, oh, you're going to have several hundred over the summer. After I agreed to do this, two weeks later, they said, well, you're going to get less than that. You're going to get about zero for the summer. <laughs> so um, because they give research participants to dissertations, to students doing their dissertations. So um, I'm collecting data on both these studies in the fall. But I still wanted to talk about something. So I'm going to talk about our two studies that I have. They're through IRB. They're ready to go. I'm just waiting on research participants. I'm going to run them. And kind of the takeaway message here is going to be a how I use communication theory in my in the way I study terrorism, violent radicalization, and counter radicalization. Um, because I know terrorism studies is kind of dominated by political scientists, sociologists. There's only a few communication people, uh, myself being one. And second, uh, I really want to start making a push um, within terrorism studies. And it's great that most people here are interns because it's going to start with you as you move forward in your careers. Uh, about the importance of actual experimentation in terrorism studies. Because as you go through your studies and as you grow as terrorism researchers, and uh, I'm sure there's some established terrorism research in the crowd, um, you'll find that there is a lot of research out there that's just speculation that's posing as science. So there's a push now, there's kind of a movement in terrorism studies to really play up the science that goes into studying radicalization, counter-radicalization, and terrorism. So I want you to take that away from this as well. Um, I'll probably go for about 25, 35 minutes, and then what I hope this turns into is if you have any specific questions, don't worry, it's going to turn black. We'll be able to read it. Um, <laughs> are you able to ask any questions you want to, and I'll be happy to tell you about the two studies or anything else that you might want to know. So I'm going to start off with uh, a really brief background about the use of theory and the use of experimentation, specifically communication theory and experimentation in the study of terrorism. Um, it occurred to me in having a communication background before I, even studied, before I started studying terrorism, um, why not use the theory we have and actually apply it to the problem of terrorism the same way we apply it to problems in communication, things like health communication politics. It's just a different context, same types of methods. So why don't we do that? Uh, after that, I'll talk about the first study that I'm doing. Um, it's it has a longer title than that, you know how academic titles are, but it basically goes around how personality interacts with communication and how that affects whether or not somebody is more or less likely to be open to radicalization. And uh, the way I talk about radicalization, I speak of it as if it's a persuasive process, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the second study, which I'm really excited about because I think it's straightforward and cool, um, is a study about something called inoculation theory. Some of you might have heard about that. Um, but essentially, inoculation theory works as a form of counter-radicalization in the way that I conceptualize it. And that will be getting tested in the field relatively soon, hopefully. After that, uh, I'll talk about some considerations and some things that I've run into and in trying to run experiments in terrorism studies. Uh, a couple things you might want to think about and then other problems that I might run into in the future. After that, I'll leave it open to harsh criticism, yelling, leaving the room, whatever you want. So I'll start with the background. Um, why use communication theory in the study of radicalization and counter-radicalization? And I'll start with radicalization. Um, I personally, conceptually, and I know that you have been, had it driven into your heads, that radicalization and terrorism both have 10,000 definitions each. I conceptualize of radicalization as fundamentally, at its core, 
a change in beliefs and attitudes, whether it's towards some kind of ideology or whatever, however you want to think about the ideology that somebody adopts, that's, that's what it is at its core. Somebody changes their mind about something. And that fundamentally is what persuasion is. We talk about persuasion in communication science, and that's all it is, a change in beliefs and attitudes. And because I conceptualize of radicalization as a change in beliefs and attitudes, that means at its core, it's an inherently communicative process. Radicalization doesn't occur without some form of communication taking place. And here we have on the left, we have Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. We know the kind of impact he's had in terms of recruiting for ISIS and being a figurehead for ISIS. In the middle, does anybody recognize this person? I've used him quite a bit recently. Canadian. Yeah, exactly. His name's Andre Poulin. He was a Canadian. He was either a teenager or uh, in his early 20s. He was uh, recruited by ISIS and uh, left and died, I think, Syria, fighting in Syria. But before he died, he recorded a number of recruitment videos for people in the West, so for Canada in the United States. And anybody recognize this charmer? A little older. William Luther Pierce. He wrote uh, the Turner Diaries and Hunter. And he founded the National Alliance, I think it's called, which at the time was the biggest white supremacist movement in the, in the uh, United States. But the point of these three heads, and these figureheads, is to, to emphasize that to get people to change their beliefs and attitudes to these particular ideologies, it required some form of communication from them. On the other side of the coin, we have these people that are doing these sorts of things. Counter-radicalization is also a persuasive process. On the left, that's Imam Mohammed Majid. He's actually from around here. I think he is head of, um, I'm going to screw up the name of the mosque itself, but it's called the Dulles Mosque, uh, Dulles Islamic Center, something like that. He does a lot of counter-radicalization work in his mosque, and he actively goes into communities that he serves and tries to get to people before um, groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda have a chance to get to them. In the center, that's Frank Mink. He is a former white supremacist who now speaks out against white supremacy and skinhead groups. Other people you might have heard of, uh, Christian Piccolini, Piccolini. He's kind of the biggest name out there now. He founded, um, that's it, like after Hayden. Yeah, so uh, he has a number of, uh, I think Frank might be part of that group, but they go into um, white neighborhoods and, be, uh, and, and engage with people who are at risk of radicalization for, um, for white supremacy. And over here, this is nobody in particular, but this is a, group of former Taliban fighters in Pakistan who are now undergoing um, their form of counseling. Um, so that would be a form of de-radicalization. But again, uh, the point here is to show that all three of these and any kind of counter-radicalization, de-radicalization effort is going to be inherently communicative. So if we think of these issues as being inherently persuasive process, if they're based in communication, then all sorts of doors open up for us in terms of the kinds of theories that we can use. And just to give you a couple, uh, if those of you that are familiar with psychology and communication, this is reason to action theory. Um, we use this quite a bit to explain uh, risky health behaviors in communication science or political behaviors in communication science. Don't worry about all the arrows and everything else. The takeaway here is that all these arrows here indicate a relationship between two concepts where we can intervene in, a, in, the, in the persuasive process. And if we consider radicalization to be a persuasive process, it gives us opportunities to disrupt that process. Uh, another example, discrete emotion theory. Um, it's not really a theory per se, but communication does a lot of work in how, um, how different messages induce different types of emotions, how those emotions are motivational, and how we can contradict those emotions. So because a lot of terrorist propaganda does uh, bring about different types of emotions, by looking at communication theory, discrete emotion theory, we can see how to intervene in those emotions. And a third, did I lose it? Oh, okay, here we go. This is just a very simple schematic of the elaboration likelihood model, which argues that the degree to which somebody is going to think something is important and think about it and be persuaded by it, it's contingent on their motivation and their ability to think about it. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about this, but again, it just shows another opportunity for intervening in the persuasive process whereby somebody adopts a radical belief or attitude. As for me, uh, the two perspectives that I'm adopting, adopting for my two studies, the first isn't really a theory per se, but more a perspective in, uh, in communication. So an old line of thinking is that 
and I'm sure you've all read about this, the, the original terrorism studies back in the 70s, maybe the early 80s, was that certain people are predisposed to become terrorists because of inherent personality traits, that people are just going to become, become terrorists because of the way they are. Um, that's not the case. We figured that out relatively quickly, especially um, when the terrorism studies grew quite a bit in the 90s and very much so in the 2000s. Um, that said, I've done research into the way um, communication affects beliefs and attitudes, specifically narratives, so stories. Um, and I found that independent of context, if people engage with certain types of communication, then they can adopt beliefs and attitudes. People aren't predisposed to adopt belief, beliefs and attitudes, especially radical beliefs and attitudes. But if they engage with certain types of communication, they may be more predisposed to do so. Now, the question that I want to ask, and it's one that I think is curious, not everybody clearly becomes a terrorist no matter how much uh, communication they engage with. No matter how much somebody reads the Turner Diaries, not everybody's going to become a white supremacist. So, the question I want to ask, oh, I screwed that up, I want these to go at the same time. It's okay. Cool slide anyway. <laughs> Um, is what makes these two people different? What makes the one person look at the Turner Diaries and adopt beliefs and attitudes consistent with the propaganda, and what makes somebody else not? And my argument in the study I'll talk about first is that that may be where personality comes in. Personality by itself might not predict whether somebody becomes a terrorist, but it might predict whether or not somebody's open to terrorist propaganda and is more persuaded by it. And that is uh, very predominant and it's been shown again and again in communication studies or communication science, but again, for different outcomes. People are more persuaded to stop smoking if they have different personality traits and engage with certain messages. So there's this interaction effect between somebody's personality and the communication they engage with, and that affects the persuasion. The second study I'm doing, or the second uh, uh, theory that I'm going to be using is called inoculation theory. And it sounds exactly like it is. An inoculation is just like vaccination. You engage with, or you are exposed to some sort of sickness, you get sick, or you're given a shot and you don't get sick, but you develop the antibodies in response to being exposed to, uh, to that illness, or to that virus, or that bacteria. Then, when something else, or the same uh, message, or sorry, the same virus or bacteria, you come into contact with that same virus or bacteria, you're defended by it, or you defend against it. And as I'll talk about in the second study, is that the same idea works for ideas, for notions, for um, beliefs, for attitudes. And within communication, it's shown that it works across the board. It's one of the theories in communication that is, is weird and that it always works. So, but it's never really been applied to terrorism studies, so I'm gonna be testing that. But first, let me talk about that personality uh, propaganda interaction. So I'll talk about the basis of the study, I'll talk a little bit about the dark tetrad and what that is. Um, how it interacts with what I'm using as a message level variable, being the vividness of the message. Um, the methods I'm using and things I'm going to be doing moving forward, and the hypotheses that I have. So as I said, the basis of the study is that people used to think that personality was the basis for whether somebody became a terrorist or not. And we know that's not the case. More contemporary work, Borum, Morgan, all the psychologists found that, that wasn't the case. But Research on communication and some research in terrorism that uses communication as a theoretical background has shown that messaging can contribute to a bunch of uh, negative outcomes, especially the adoption of extremist beliefs and attitudes. And that message style and content can interact with those individual difference variables. So what I just said, in that people who have certain predispositions may be affected by messages of certain types. And ultimately, the takeaway question is, do certain types of messages appeal to certain individuals? When will a message be uh, persuasive to somebody to the point that it drives that person to adopt beliefs and attitudes, maybe adopt intentions, maybe engage in behaviors? And if anybody has any questions, or you need to slow down, please feel free to tell me. I'll talk pretty fast. So the personality traits that I'm looking at are collectively known as the dark tetrad. It's a really cool way to say it's four things. But it's been called, it was first called the dark triad, then they added one other one, and they called it the dark tetrad, but it just means four things. Um, some of which you will have heard of. So they've all been linked to negative outcomes like bullying, aggression, um, self-harm, other harm, things like that. So these four are, number one, narcissism, which is a very inflated sense of self-worth. Everybody knows that part, but it's also linked 
with an underlying insecurity. So narcissists, they think highly of themselves, or they, they act like they think highly of themselves, but they're very worried they're never gonna be able to keep up and, um, and meet the expectations for themselves. So what happens with narcissists in terms of the negative outcomes that are associated with them, they often act out against people if they're unable to achieve what they feel about themselves. Machiavellians, uh, so Machiavellianism is a predisposition to use other people for your own gains. So if uh, someone is a liar to gain, um, gain some sort of advantage over somebody else, if somebody takes advantage of somebody else, they have to be high on Machiavellianism. Then the next two are a lot of fun. Subclinical psychopathy. <laughs> that, anybody see who know who this is? Yeah, it's Euron. Yeah, okay. Game of Thrones fans, that's from that's Euron from this past week. All right, so subclinical psychopathy. And it's the way they worded that and what they call subclinical psychopathy, it's just a clever way of getting around saying it's just psychopathy. So what subclinical psychopathy is, is a sense of impulsivity without thinking about how your actions affect other people around you. So a lot of people call this sociopathy, but it's also linked with impulsivity and thrill seeking. So one who engages in behaviors that put other people in harm's way, not thinking about how it affects them, that would be called subclinical psychopaths. And finally, everyday sadism, which is another fun one to talk about. Um, so this is enjoyment witnessing forms of cruelty to others. So maybe not actually engaging in cruelty, but uh, there's been some research to show that people score high on this scale who like watch YouTube videos of police brutality, who um, enjoy watching particularly bloody MMA matches, things like that. People rank highly there. So people who enjoy seeing others hurt tend to rank highly on everyday sages. So these three, uh, subclinical psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism were originally the dark triad. Then somebody decided, this, this used to be folded into subclinical psychopathy. And uh, I think it was Paul House said, no, it's different. So they, they broke it out of the dark tetrad. So these are the personality traits that I'm gonna argue interact with a certain message feature to, be, to make a message persuasive to the point that somebody would adopt extremist beliefs and attitudes. So that interaction is gonna be with message vividness. Because if you've had any experience in looking at terrorist propaganda, it often varies in terms of the vividness that it has. There's some that's very bloody, there's beheading videos, there's execution videos, but there's also videos like the first part of the Andre Poulin video, which is just him talking to a camera. So they vary in vividness. Now, to give you an example, or not yet, I'm sorry. Um, the reason that vividness is important is because, again, coming back to communication theory, uh, communication theorists have shown that vividness affects different people in different ways as to whether a message is persuasive or not. Uh, there's an individual difference variable called sensation seeking, so it sounds very much like impulsivity. Um, that people who rate high on sensation seeking, so people who look for extreme sports, um, people who seek out dangerous situations, those types of people, they're more inclined to be persuaded by vivid uh, stimuli. And the other one is high need for cognition, so people who tend to like to think about things, people who enjoy puzzles, things like that, they tend to be more persuaded by vivid stimuli. Now, to give you an example of message vividness, the variation of music classic example, people recognize these two? It's been a while. <laughs> the stepsisters, yeah, stepsisters Cinderella. Does anybody know what happened to the stepsisters in the original story? Yeah. One got. Yeah, their eyes got gouged out. Who doesn't know this part? All right, good. I want to know. I want some people to not know, so I actually tell this story. All right, so every Disney movie is like a really cleaned up version of something awful. So in the original Cinderella, um, the stepsisters, they you know they tried it on the glass slipper, oh, it didn't fit. Wasn't that nice in the original? In the original, the um, the stepmother took a blade and cut off, and they're like, oh, the shoe doesn't fit. And like, she's like, no, wait. And she sawed off one of their heels so it would fit. And the prince is like, oh, it's all bloody. So they tried, <laughs> so they tried the next person, and the next, they're like, oh, it doesn't fit. So they cut off her toes, and they're like, oh, it's all bloody, it doesn't fit. And they go to Cinderella, and it fits. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because the, uh, the original version is much more vivid than the, uh, the cleaned up version that you had um, from Disney. And they also had their eyes pecked out by crows. So that also happened in the original fairy tale version. So um, the original story would have usually had some sort of moral to it. So uh, communication theory would argue that 
this original story would be more persuasive to people who are high sensation seekers and things like that. They'd be more inclined or more disinclined to act like the stepsisters acted because you connect those poor behaviors with the outcome. So just a real kind of interesting connection. Okay, so that's kind of the theory behind, behind um, what I'm doing. Now let me tell you what I've actually got so far in terms of methods of what we're doing. Um, first of all, uh, between subjects, experimental design, very easy. <coughs> Excuse me. One vivid message, one non-vivid message. Hopefully I'll get about 350 people. Um, the narrative stimuli that I'm using, so the story that I'm using, is from a group called the Serbenia Freedom Alliance. Has anybody ever heard of that group? Good, they don't exist without anybody raise their hand. So I'll explain why I, um, I used a fake group uh, as I get to the end of the presentation. But um, the actual narrative is derived from Hamas. I used the Hamas story and then changed the group to the Serbania Freedom Alliance. So I'm using a Hamas narrative. You need to find them all over their website. They're not hard to find. Um, the three dark, the original dark triad, um, using the Jones and Paul House story, Jones and Paul House story, or um, measure. Good alpha, all higher than 0.72. And for everyday sadism, I'm using this older one uh, from Omira et al. And that's also pretty highly reliable. Now the outcome variables, the things I'm measuring in response to, after I, I check the interactions, I check the main effects, I'm going to be checking people's beliefs, attitudes, and intentions in relation to the group. So things like beliefs relate to the factual things that are told in the story. So the story that I'm using tell, tells, um, tells a story of an old woman being executed by a guard, um, or by a, um, yeah, by a guard. So things I'll be asking in terms of beliefs are, do you really think that the woman was executed? Um, do you think the Serbenia Freedom Alliance um, exists in Serbenia? Things like that. So actual facts that associate with it. Then you get to attitudes. So then you ask things like, do you think the guards were justified in killing the old woman? What do you think about what happened there? Those are attitudes. And then intentions, which I'm really not expecting much, but I'll be, I'll be interested to see what I get there. And I won't be expecting much because nobody will have any affiliation with this, this fake group. Would be, um, if given the opportunity, would you give money to this group? If given the opportunity, would you protest for this group? If given the opportunity, would you get in a fight for this group? And so on. So different varying levels of support for the group. You can't just say, would you kill this group? Because very few will say no. Yeah. Is there a question? Sorry, so are you picking people that have already demonstrated that they are narcissistic or have mental rebellion like tendencies? No, I'll be measuring that during the, um, the the actual study. And then I'll probably end up doing a median split to do high low. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to stop me in the middle too if there's anything that's not clear. Okay, so given all this, this is what's happening next once I get my participants and everything. These are the predictions that I have. Um, pretty obviously I expect that all four of those those personality traits to make a narrative, a terrorist narrative, more persuasive. Now I want to be very careful to emphasize here, this doesn't mean that narcissism is associated with becoming a terrorist or Machiavellianism is associated with becoming a terrorist. It just means the narrative is more persuasive than that, which is a starting point for that sort of thing. And then for the interaction effects, I expect the vivid condition to be more uh, pronounced, or the effects associated with the vivid condition to be more pronounced than those with the non-vivid. Any question about the first study? I'll give a chance at the end too, but if anybody wants to jump in, you're welcome to. Second study is way cooler. <laughs> okay, so the second study I'm doing, as I said, relates to inoculation theory. So I'll talk about inoculation as a form of counter-radicalization, which is something I'm really interested in now. I'm really interested in things like intervention, um, because um, not only is CV kind of come to the fore, PVs come to the fore, but I think there's a lot of opportunities for um, communication people to get in here because a lot of the interventions that are being talked about in CVE and PVE have been done for decades in things like health communication and political communication. We can just use them in, the, in this context. So I'll talk about inoculation as counter-radicalization, talk about my methods, predictions, and then I'll give you a sample of the stimuli that I'm using. Not a sample, I'll show you screenshots from the, uh, the stimuli I'm using because I'm still editing them. So, Again, if we think about inoculation theory, <clears throat> I mentioned this briefly at the beginning. Uh, the idea is that ideas function the same as viruses and vaccinations. That you can develop a resistance to a certain persuasive message if you're given a message beforehand. Um, is anybody here a psychologist or 
done any work in psychology at all? We're mostly political scientists here. Yeah. Political psychology. Political psychology. Do you know what psychological reactance is? Okay, so psychological, this is all based around the idea of psychological reactance. And psychological reactance is the idea that all people have an inherent need. It's like a basic function that we want to make our own decisions. And we don't like when other people try to persuade us. So you know that feeling you get when somebody kind of approaches you and asks you to here, take this flyer, or here, do this, and you get that immediate kind of pull away effect? That's psychological reactance. In communication, we argue that if it becomes clear to somebody that somebody else is trying to persuade them, they'll be disinclined to do what that person says because they feel like their autonomy is being taken away. And to reestablish that autonomy, they'll often resist or even go in the other direction. Um, this inoculation theory has been shown consistent across all manner of, um, of context. It ha it's very strange in how often it does work in communication science. And there's two real major components to inoculation. I'll give you an example to explain what they are. Um, refutational preemption and an alternative perspective. So refutational preemption is I tell you this other person is going to come to you and tell you and try to persuade you of something. So you warn them before they're persuaded. And you plant that seed in their head that somebody's going to come and try to persuade them. After you do that, you give them an alternative view or an alternative perspective or alternative idea and plant that seed first. If you give that warning and then give an alternative view, you essentially give them antibodies, which is where the inoculation comes from, not physical antibodies, but you know, it's a metaphor, to, to uh, block any persuasive message that may sound like the one that you warned them about. So it's essentially you're giving them a small version of that idea virus, and then you build resistance to that idea. So to give you an example, Suppose bomb is my symbol for do bad things. So um, suppose al-Baghdadi, we all know that, that communication can cause people to have changes in beliefs and attitudes. Um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has convinced several people to fight for ISIS. We know that exists. But what if we got to somebody before al-Baghdadi got to them? And we have somebody like Muhammad Majid at the Dulles Area Muslim Center. If he came and said, al Baghdadi is going to tell you A, B, and C to try to convince you to join ISIS. This is what he's going to say. And instead of following what he says, why don't you do this instead? And dumb is my symbol for don't do bad things. So, and do this instead. This is a more peaceful way to express your political beliefs. So, then this person adopts the political beliefs that were espoused in the first place. On top of that, if Baghdadi comes later and says, no, you should uh, join ISIS, do this, do that, Inoculation theory would predict that that would be blocked. You'd be inoculated against that because of the message that Muhammad Majid gave you beforehand. So you essentially develop these psychological antibodies to what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi would come and say to you if you get to them beforehand. So it's not de-radicalization. It's, it's almost like, I call it preemptive counter-radicalization. You get there before other people do, and you block other people from coming in. I hope this impressed you, by the way, because this slide took forever. <laughs> Okay, so the methods I'm using to test this. This is my experimental design, two by two between subjects again. Um, the two cells, I'm sorry, the four cells. Um, number one would be the inoculation message source. So I'm using four inoculation messages, really. Um, on the one side, we have right-wing messages. On the left side, we have left-wing messages, um, appropriately enough. And I also want to test while I'm doing this, I also want to test the, uh, the impact of uh, the source of the message. So I will be delivering an inoculation message to people to say you're going to encounter this message and it might persuade you, but here's reasons why it shouldn't persuade you. Here's some alternative perspectives. Um, I also hired actors to play former terrorists to deliver the same message. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm testing whether or not um, if somebody receives a message from anybody, i.e. myself, or somebody who's a former terrorist, which are getting a lot of press lately about um, them being valuable in counter-radicalization, CV, and PVE, and I think they are, um, then that message, that inoculation effect should be stronger. And then we have another group who they don't receive an inoculation message at all. Um, let's see. Hope I get 450 people. We'll see. And then the outcome me measures that I'm going to be measuring are, uh, are right there. So negative cognitions in, in response to um, the terrorist narrative. Um, I'm sorry, I should have said this beforehand. After the inoculation message, they're, they're directed to an actual stimulus. Um, I didn't have to change the group this time. 
I used a, a part of the manifestos of the Weather Underground and the National Alliance to test these things. And only white participants go on this side because I don't want to, I mean, it doesn't make sense to try to do non-white participants on a white supremacist side, so it's all white students on that side. So, okay, things I'm measuring. Negative cognitions, counter-arguments, the perceptions of threat, not threat by the group, but perceptions of threat that that group is gonna to try to persuade them of something. Um, negative emotion, source credibility, attitudes toward the group, perceived effectiveness of the message, and that one might seem weird, but there is a very strong correlation with whether somebody believes a message is persuasive and whether or not it actually persuades them or not. So if you perceive a message as being persuasive for somebody else, it's really strongly correlated to being persuasive for you as well. So this almost acts as a proxy for, um, for actual persuasiveness. And then behavioral intention is very similar to what I'm doing in the first study. And these are all kind of the uh, very, very thing, much what, what you'd expect, um, all the predictions for the, uh, for the hypotheses. And I'm, I almost made this a research question, but I'm not sure, but I do get the feeling that um, a message being delivered by somebody posing as a former extremist will have a stronger effect than a message coming from the researcher, myself. And both will be stronger than the control condition. So, um, just to give you a couple ideas about what these look like. This is Sam. Um, she is a, supposed to be a former Weather Underground person. Um, I'm use, I don't, the reason that I'm using somebody young, you'd never be a uh, Weather Underground person considering the Weather Underground has been gone for years. But it doesn't say in the message that I'm, saying, that I'm giving people that this is Weather Underground. It's just part of their manifesto that it shows kind of their, uh, their goals. So what Sam is arguing, well, what Sam says is that this group's going to, you might run into a message that shows you, or that tries to get you to adopt certain beliefs and attitudes that are consistent with A, B, and C. Here's reasons why you shouldn't adopt A, B, and C, and here's some counterpoints. Now, the way that I'm selling this and saying you might encounter a message is I'm using a cover story in the experiment where I'm saying that you can be directed to one of 20 messages, because we're trying to measure perspectives on messages, and one of those might come from an extremist group. In reality, they're all going to an extremist group. So we can't just say we're measuring perceptions of terrorist messages. You don't want to give it away. So we're uh, putting this message before and tell them that you have a 5% chance of being directed to a terrorist group. And I don't have a screenshot of either one, but for the right wing, this is the 9th Panzer reenactment people in Pennsylvania. Um, my sister did it for a while. Um, her husband is still way into it. And they dig it, and one of them is <laughs> one, one of them is uh, he's a former uh, white supremacist, and he's all tatted up. He's got tattoos everywhere. Um, he's a former kind of he regrets what he used to be like, um, but he still looks the part because he has all the tattoos. Um, and I mean, his head is still still clean. But um, but yeah, he, I I talked to my sister and I talked to him, and he's going to be my my former extremist for the National Alliance because you know he looks the part even if he's not the part. So I'll be, deliver, I'll be having him deliver the same message that Sam did. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so before I wrap up, just a couple of considerations that I have, a couple of concerns that I have, and things to think about moving forward in experimentation and, uh, and extremism. Number one, I've run into people who have argued, like, why are you using college students? You can't use college students to study terrorism. And I would argue strongly that that's absolutely not the case. Um, terrorism researchers argue again and again that terrorists are like everybody else. They just become terrorists for certain reasons that we haven't exactly figured out yet. But they come from people college age. They come from regular population before they become terrorists. So if we're going to adopt the idea that terrorists are, they might be statistically abnormal in their behavior, but they're psychologically normal or relatively normal to the general population, we need to test and work with the general population to understand the process before they become terrorists. And number two, <clears throat> excuse me, the age range of college age students is when they typically become more strongly politically involved and they are attractive recruitment targets for terrorist groups. And as exhibits A and B, I give you again Andre Poulin and these two who tried to leave for ISIS, I think earlier this year. They were college students in, I want to say, Louisiana, if I remember right. But I know that I will run into, inevitably, all the regular criticisms about using a college cycle, rightfully so. 
But we do we, we do what we have with what we have. Or we do what we can with what we have. Um, second, try and deal with the IRD. That's fun. And this will explain why I use the fake group or Serbenia. So um, I ran into a little friction with the IRB when I said I want to test terrorist messages on student populations. Um, <laughs> that's what they said. They said, well, are you going to turn these, are you going to go off and join ISIS? Um, I said no. I hope no. Um, <laughs> but to get around it with the first study, which is the first one I designed, I told them what I would do was use a fake terror, a fake group name and use a real terrorist narrative and assign the narrative of the group name so they can't go join a group because the group doesn't exist. And we tell them that in debriefing. When, the, when he studies all over, we tell them this group doesn't exist, you can't go join them, and they might feel misled, but it's better than them going and trying something they shouldn't do. Um, then I talked to the IRB for a little bit, and they're like, okay, you, we seem to trust what you're doing. So for the second group, they allowed me to use those uh, manifestos as they were. So they don't say whether underground or national alliance in the stimuli, but they're directly from those groups. Uh, the best advice I can give you here is like dealing with these is different. Um, it's not even going to be a matter of you following the rules of your institution's IRB because you have to do that anyway. It's developing relationships with people in the Office of Research Protections, letting them know what you're doing, get them familiar with your research. And in doing so, you'll find that you have a lot, it's a lot easier to work with them. Most IRBs are, they're, they're willing to cooperate with you if they think you're doing good research. And I found Penn State's IRB to be very helpful in that. Now they know I'm not radicalizing people. So they've been good. And some final issues. Um, don't restrict yourself to college campuses. I'm not going to. I've considered using MTurk if I have to in the next couple of years with the studies I'll be doing. Um, make sure. As I'm doing, you pilot your stimuli if you do experimental research. Uh, a lot of people feel, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I were to run the vividness study, if I were to run that study without piloting the stimuli, suppose I run that and I find out later that the participants didn't think one was vivid and one was non vivid. All your results are shot. So pilot your stimuli as much as you can before you actually run the experiment. Number two, I'm going to emphasize these for people who are statistics nerds like myself. If we're going to do experimental work, we have to do power analyses so we can get the right effect sizes and the right sample sizes. Um, the reason I say let's exceed expectations of common social science practice is because in communication science, make maybe 10% of studies mention power analyses and sample sizes and how they affect sample sizes, which really affects whether or not we can believe the results that are being put out there. So because I want terrorism studies to be well respected within the uh, social scientific literature, let's do power analyses. And most importantly, we've got to do better at measurement of outcomes because I myself am tired of looking at papers with no data to back it up. That's why I support groups like START. I support centers that, that bring researchers together that do actual quantitative research that use outcomes and measure outcomes. Because I don't know what the percent is, but I'm sure you've read, there's so many blogs and non-peer reviewed things out there that don't talk about outcomes and talk about how things affect other things without any kind of science behind it. So I really hope that terrorism studies moves forward in experimentation in using good, reliable, valid measurements rather than what we've done so far, generally speaking. And finally, I want to mention that both the projects that I've talked about are, part of, are going to be turned into larger studies. These two studies are essentially me testing the water of experimentation. On the inoculation one especially, I can't say the name of the group I'm working with. I didn't ask them if I could. But I'm working with a, um, a CVE organization where we're going to test inoculation among um, budding white nationals, people who are at risk for white nationalism online. So we're going to go into those, those communities and actually try to test these inoculation messages and see if they work um, after we see if it works with the, uh, the initial study. So with that, I will be quiet. I'll allow you to ask any questions or criticize or whatever you like. So thank you, and uh, happy to field your questions.